Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kerek Almasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all. I can see that you guys are joining from all around the world. This means the world to me because on this channel, I work day and night to present quality content and quality analysis, not the ones that you can see or you are already seeing or hearing on your mainstream media outlets. I do my research to present to you what I think about these cases. I'm not here to tell you what you should think, but I present to you the other side of the story. And since I opened my eyes to politics, um, I learned that every problem has a solution. But for the United States, every problem, the solution for this problem is either hitting bombing or selling weapons. This is what I saw since I opened my eyes. I haven't seen for a very long time the United States is mediating to solve a situation or try to mediate or try to strike a diplomatic deal. Unfortunately speaking, this superpower has lost its capability, ability, credibility to become a neutral or uh, let's say the middleman or the word police. The United States is part of the problem nowadays because its excessive use of force to solve the problems of the world has gone too far. So let me get this straight. The United States, American troops came under attack near the borders between Jordan and Syria. The United States blamed Iran and said, you, Iran, stand behind the attack on my troops, so I'm going to retaliate to establish deterrence against you. Okay, fine. So what are you going to do with the United States? In the past few two live streamings, we addressed the options of the United States, and I told you the United States is not going to attack Iran. They're going to hit the Assets of the Iran-linked groups in the region, as I predicted, predicted, and the United States did what I told you, because the United States, despite its, um, they want to establish or re-establish deterrence against Iran, but at the same time, they know the repercussions of such an attack is going to be massive, not only for the United States, for the region, for the global economy, because Think about it. What if the United States attacked Iran? What is going to happen next? One, Iran has enriched its uranium, according to reports, 83%. And I was reading today that they need to enrich it to 85% to produce a nuclear weapon. So if they want to, they can produce a nuclear weapon. If they come under a direct attack or, an ex or there is an existential threat against them. Two, all the assets of the United States in the regions, the vessels, the cargo ships, the energy sector will come under fire, so the energy prices will dramatically increase, skyrocket, there will be global economic crisis, and this will mainly affect the European economies as well. And the other thing is Americans have around 50,000 to 60,000 troops in the region. They're like sitting ducks, so they're going to come under direct Iranian attack, which acquires and has sophisticated precision missiles, is capable of hitting every single corner in West Asia. So this is why the United States didn't attack Iran. So they come now and they are flexing their muscles against what they call Iran-linked militias or groups in Syria, my country, and in Iraq to establish or re-establish deterrence, something that is a mockery and something that in, I'm going to tell you in this live streaming that it's not going to be the case. And what is the real purpose behind these attacks? I can see that at the beginning of this live streaming, some of you were discussing uh, what is my religion. And I don't bring my religion much into this conversation, but I was born and raised in Aleppo in Syria. I'm from an Armenian ethnicity because my grandparents survived the Armenian genocide. So they fled to Aleppo and I was born and raised in Aleppo in a Christian Orthodox family, in an Armenian family, but I'm Syrian with the heart and the mind, and I'm here to present to you probably a Syrian point of view of what's happening in the region. So in this live streaming, we're going to first shed light on what the American press, especially the ones that support President Biden, MSNBC and CNN said, what 
Lindsey Graham, the psychopath, has said in this regard. And what was the comment of Tucker Carlson on Lindsey Graham's calls to bomb Iran directly? And then I'm going to tell you what is missing in the U.S. press. What are they hiding from you? What are the two important information that they're hiding from you? And then I'm going to tell you based on my analysis and also supporting my analysis with the statements of Scott Twitter and Larry Johnson, why these attacks won't establish deterrence against Iran. And later, I'm going to show you the difference between the Chinese approach and the American approach. And finally, why the war in Ukraine has come to an end. So thank you very much, guys, for tuning in. We, let's start with what the MSNBC said in this regard, which is, which is close to the Biden administration. They said the United States struck 85 targets at seven facilities in Iraq and Syria last night. The strikes were carried out over 30 minutes and used over 125 precision munitions. Some of the strikes were conducted by B-1B bombers, which departed from Dias Air Force Base in Texas on Friday for a more than 6,000-mile flight. The targets struck included command and control operation centers, intelligence centers, rockets and missiles, unmanned air vehicle storage warehouses, and logistics and munitions supply chain facilities used by Iran-backed militia groups. The response is the first in what is expected to be a series of strikes in retaliation for the killing of three American soldiers, according to a US, U.S. defense official. The military action is a significant escalation in Washington's bid to deter the growing threat from Iran-backed groups across the Middle East. Middle East. Civilians and soldiers were among those killed in Syria and Iraq, officials in both countries said today. A spokesman for the Iraqi armed forces called the strikes, quote, a threat that will drag Iraq and the region into unforeseen consequences. The Iranian foreign ministry said it was, quote, another strategic mistake by the United States. This is what the expert on the MSNBC channel said also in this regard. Let's take a look together. Breaking news out of the Middle East. The U.S. has launched airstrikes in retaliation for an attack on a U.S. base in Jordan that killed three soldiers. Let's bring in national security and global affairs reporter for NBC News's investigative unit, Dan DeLuce at the Pentagon. Dan. Yes, defense officials are telling us that the retaliatory airstrikes have begun in Iraq and Syria against Iranian-backed militias, something that obviously the White House has been warning they would do. They are, it has now begun. This operation has been pretty clearly now telegraphed for days since three U.S. soldiers were killed in Jordan in that drone attack on Sunday. And now this operation has begun. And keep in mind, administration officials have made it clear that this is not a one-off, that this will extend beyond today over days. It will be a campaign and it will involve multiple uh, strikes and other operations. But right now, we can say that the retaliatory strikes have begun in Iraq and Syria against those Iranian-backed militias that have launched more than 160 attacks on UN, U.S. forces since October 7th, since that war started between Israel and Hamas. So this is on MSNBC. Now on the CNN, I'm going to to um I will go through what the MSNBC and CNN said, and I'm going to comment on them. Okay, guys, it was meant to sound devastating. The article starts and likely felt so to the pro-Iranian militias on the receiving end. But Friday night's airstrikes against over 80 targets inside Iraq and Syria were so far a comparatively limited response to the worst loss of U.S. military life in the region in nearly three years. That was a clear and calculated choice. The Biden administration faced a near impossible task. Hit hard enough to show you mean it, but also ensure your opponent can absorb the blow without lashing out in return. The U.S. has telegraphed its response for over five days. 
with senior U.S. officials briefing about its nature, its severity, and even hinting at its targets. This is very important, guys. How the United States telegraphed its response to the senior U.S. officials and the the U.S. senior officials, of course, they leaked it to the media. This was all on purpose. Why? This warning was likely designed to reduce the risk of misunderstanding and perhaps enable the militias targeted to shift locations and lessen the loss of life. It may have also been intended to ensure U.S. strikes were not mistaken for the work of Israel, which could have sparked retaliation against the Israelis and risked another cycle of escalation. It is almost miraculous that wider conflict has not already erupted in the Middle East four months after Palestinian militant group Hamas attack on Israel and the ongoing assault on Gaza it sparked. Wars normally happen in the rare event that both sides want them, or in the more common occasion when parties determine open conflict is unavoidable, or sometimes when they have run out of diplomatic space, or they stumble into them through a wild spiral of escalation. Neither Iran nor the United States want a war. The Biden administration has elections looming in which it doesn't need another costly foreign adventure trouble over its Israel policy or rising oil prices. Iran's economy is still shaky, internal unrest is a not yet distant memory, and it has wider goals of outsized regional influence, milking its technical relationship with Moscow and the apparent pacey pursuit of nuclear weapons. So, now that these two MSNBC and CNN reported about it, and we have seen opinions and also the information. The first thing that all came to my mind when I watched the MSNBC report, I was like, this guy is just repeating the script, right? And it, it, it's funny that these people get paid uh, probably six figures <laughs> just to repeat the same script, you know, reading from a teleprompter. Um this is not a journalistic work, you know, like not trying to find holes in the narrative of the American side, not try to criticize your government, to be un- unconditionally on the side of the United States and repeating and pirating these talking points. Iran linked militias, Iran backed militias, etc., etc., etc. But this, these militias or these fighters or these militants, what, what is the identity of these groups? Who are they? They're Syrians, they're Iraqis, right? They're not Iranians, those who are fighting in Syria or those who are fighting in Iraq. And why the Iraqi Iran-backed militias or the Syrian Iran-backed militias attacking American forces? Why do they rule out that very important information? And that is one, the Iraqi government asked for the American troops to leave the country and the Americans said, no, we're here, we simply stay. And now they want to open negotiations with the Iraqi side. We don't know if they are genuine about it or not. And I don't know if we have to trust them or not anyways. But they are not leaving the country. The, you Imagine you have a host in your home and you ask your host to leave and he's not living. So what would you do, right? In Syria, they are illegally based in Syria. They are blocking the Syrian most important trade route in Al Tanf border crossing with Jordan and Iraq. They are isolating Syria from its neighboring countries. And on the eastern shore of the Euphrates, they are in full control of the oil and gas fields, not because they need the oil, but because the Syrian government needs the oil to reconstruct the country so that they keep the country poor to impoverish the people. 90% of the people are below the poverty line to force them and tell them, look, Assad, you defended him and we couldn't overthrow him. Now you're going to starve and he will not be able to provide you with the basic necessities. Now you have to remove him by yourself. We couldn't make, we couldn't do it. You have to do it by yourself. This is the reason, right? Why they are occupying the oil fields and imposing draconian sanctions on the Syrian people to push them beyond, below the poverty line. So they don't mention these things. Are these militias supported by Iran? Yes. The Syrian army is also supported by Iran. But is Iran telling them to do these things? They have their independent character. This is their country. It's Syria. It's Iraq. Right? They receive weapons from Iran. It's not like Iran is giving them as a gift. Syria pays in return for the weapons that they buy. 
or they sell them other materials, for example, from the Syrian natural resources to for exchange. They have different channels between the both countries for communication, coordination, military level, security level. It's Syria, right? They, they, they are attacking American occupation forces in Syria. That is illegal. But now the Americans come and then bomb Syria again against international law. But international law, as we know, guys, means nothing for the United States. The international law, the rules-based order, is only a set of rules that the United States sets, and it can change every day, and in a way that it should serve the interests of the UN's foreign policy objectives in the region. And if you disagree with that, they will come and bomb you. I mean, I suspect that in the future... If the if the countries or if the governments do not follow some of the some of the American aspirations, such as about the climate change, for example, or you have to buy the vaccines from their companies. If you don't do that, then they will come and bomb you. You know, like what is left for every for every small problem or big problem, they come and bomb countries. This is their only solution. And when I when I call the people in Washington D.C., those who are in charge of the foreign policy or shaping the foreign policy or um, have influence over the foreign policy, those who are close to the military industrial complex, when I call them psychopaths, I really mean it, man. Like Lindsey Graham after the bombing of the targets in Syria and Iraq. This is what he said on Fox TV. If you want a war with us, bring it on. We will blow you off the map. I'm not worried about losing a war with Iran. They should be worried about losing a war with us. Take a look. If you want a war with us, bring it on. We'll blow you off the friggin' map. I'm not worried about losing a war with Iran. They should be worried about losing. If you want a war with us, bring it on. We'll blow you off the friggin' map. I'm not worried about losing a war with Iran. They should be worried about losing. <laughs> what is this, man? Imagine any other country official or an MP or a congressman or any personality speaks like this, right? He would be the second day on the front pages of the American uh, press and calling him out. And this guy is just like, if there is any any small fire anywhere around the world, he's just dumping <laughs> weapons, you know? This is what he does. This is that these people are uh, the middleman between the military contractors and any nation willingly or unwillingly wanting to either uh, buy weapons or to sell weapons to any party that is willing to use against the enemies of the United States. This is the bitter truth about this case. And Tucker Carlson is correct on this. I don't know what's your opinion about him, guys, but. Tucker Carlson recently, he was on point about these cases. And he says, what exactly would happen to the United States if we declared war on Iran and started blowing up their infrastructure? Lindsey Graham has no clue what would happen. He hasn't told it true. He is almost 70 years old and has no children. He doesn't care, but neither amazingly do most of his colleagues in Washington. They are, is reckless and he is. Here's fellow neocon Lindsey Graham just spelling it out and calling for the bombing of Iran. So I've been on the phone all day to the Mideast, and I've told our allies and people with connections to Iran, what I would do, I would tell Iran that if Hezbollah attacks Israel, we're going to come after you, the Iranians, and have a coordinated effort between the United States and Israel to put Iran out of the oil business by destroying their refineries. There are four major refineries in Iran. They're fixed targets. Uh, if Hezbollah attacks Israel, I would make Iran pay a heavy price. What exactly would happen to the United States if we declared war on Iran and started blowing up their infrastructure? Lindsey Graham has no clue what would happen. He hasn't thought it through. He's almost 70 years old and he has no children. He doesn't care. But neither, amazingly, do most of his colleagues in Washington. They're as reckless as he is. Texas Congressman Dan Crenshaw took to social media to call for what he described as a war to end all wars, as if there is such a thing. But of course, there isn't such a thing. Wars beget more war. The bigger the conflict, the uglier and longer lasting the consequences. See World War I for details. Guys, um, yeah, unfortunately in the United States, the people who are critical of the US foreign policy and they have big platforms are very, very few. And look, I don't give, uh, I don't trust people like um, 
like like this, you know, like, uh, oh, I trust Tucker Carlson. No. But in the past 10 years, I followed Tucker Carlson about on Syria, about COVID, and now in Ukraine, and in, in now what's happening with Iran. And I found him critical. Maybe he's uh, just uh, try, uh, being a Trojan horse. I don't know. Maybe they're preparing for something new for him in the future. I mean, even Alex Jones, who was critical of Israel for the past decades, two decades at least, he's now saying that Iran wants war with Israel because they probably bought him, right? So I, I do not trust people like this. I don't know what are their intentions and because there are so many people that they prepare them for the public. For example, RFK, he was uh, pushed during the COVID era as a strong critic of the pharmaceutical industry, as a strong critic of the Ukraine war, and he gained the trust of the people. And now all of a sudden when the is, is, this war erupted in the Gaza Strip, he became completely Zionist. When I, when I was interviewing uh, Daniel McAdams from the Ron Paul Institute, he said, it is disturbing to hear someone like RFK, who in the past has stood for peace, sound like John Bolton on steroids. That was so funny, man. <laughs> Why I'm bringing this example? Because I just watched before the live streaming a segment of RFK with uh, the comedian Dave, Dave Smith. I don't know, guys, if you know Dave Smith. He was really critical of this case and about Ukraine war. And um, I really find him sympathetic when I watch him and he understands uh, like difficult issues in the region despite being so far away from uh, from the region. I find him a little bit sympathetic when he speaks. I was thinking of emailing him. I don't know. I just found him that he has his public email uh, written in his bio. So I wanted to maybe send him an email and say maybe he wants to host me as a Syrian because I want to like you know establish bridges with the Americans who are anti-war in this regard. And now, guys, since we are speaking about this, uh, what the United States did in Syria and and um, in Iraq, I want to show you the um, wh why what Scott Richard said in this regard, which is uh, in line with my point of view. He says eighty-five targets struck. Five days after the fact, if anyone thinks this was anything other than one big sound and light show, you are insane. Nothing of importance was struck. Nothing will change. We spent nearly $1 trillion a year for this. And I told him, climb down from a tree moment. He said, maybe we should try not climbing up the tree to begin with. I mean, I totally agree with him. I think this is a moment of a climb down from a tree. Uh, bombing Syria and Iraq five days after or six days after the incident of the attack against the American forces in uh, near the borders between Syria and uh, Jordan is an invitation for the militias or the headquarters of these Iran-backed militias to evacuate. And this is my information right now. And I saw local reporters in Syria taking photos of buses leaving some of the main headquarters that were suspected that the United States will hit these places and they were taking vacations and going home. Um, it was, it, they, they were military buses. So it seems that some of the cables and the telegrams that the United States sent to their officials that what are they going to do, what are the options, and where are they going to hit, of course, those were leaked highly likely to the allies of Iran or the allies of Syria or the allies of Iraq, and they knew the targets and they knew most of the targets, let's say. So they evacuated it highly likely and they kept some of the warehouses, military warehouses, and the Americans bombed it. So yes, I think this is a, a flexing a muscle moment, climbing down a tree moment. It is more for the American public, for the consumption of the American public, because he, uh, Biden had to do something about it. He cannot do nothing, but he cannot bomb Iran. Therefore, there is this, uh, when, you, when you find a goat who, is, uh, who climbed very high over the tree, on the tree, you help the goat to come down <laughs> and climb down the tree, right? This is what I think the Iranians and the Iraqis did in this regard. And this is an opinion also shared by uh, Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson says that this is uh, also a show. Take a look. And 
I know for a fact that, you know, in, in Al Udid, the Air Force Base in Qatar, there's the uh, Combined Air Operations Center, the CAOC, C A O C. And the general in charge of that CAOC was on the phone with his Russian counterpart who had was in charge of forces in Syria going, uh, hey, uh, stand by. Uh, we're going to be bombing in this location at this time, and we're going to use this many weapons, and we're going to come from this direction. Uh, do you copy? And the Russian would go, da, da, you know. And then the, the Russians would tell the Syrians, and the Russians and Syrians cleared everything out, and the bombs came in, created a big cloud of dust, and we went, by God, we showed them. <laughs> and that's exactly what's going on right now. And I, I I agree with him. I agree with him. And I think this was a big flex of muscles for the United States. And this is the map of control over Syria, guys. And this is where the Americans hit here, as you can see. And most of which was on the border crossing in Al Bukamal in Al Qaim, from both sides of the borders here on the Iraqi side and also near the contact line between the United States. Uh, Americans are on the yellow side. So they bombed the the line, the separation line between the American forces and the Syrian resistance forces. And also they bombed on the both sides of the border in al Qaim border crossing, um, which the Syrians and the Iraqis opened because the Americans, as I mentioned, guys, they're occupying the main trade route and border crossing between Syria and Iraq here. So they blocked trade between Syria and Iraq. So they had to open another trade route here. And while the Americans bombing these um, areas in Syria and Iraq, of course, ISIS is just... Uh, on a standby, you know, <laughs> they're waiting for any opportunity. And ISIS exploits US strikes to attack Iraqi forces in Al Anbar region. The Iraqi army and the popular mobilization forces clashed with ISIS militants in Western Anbar governorate on the 3rd of February, an Iraqi security source told Al Mayadeen. The Iraqi Al Nujaba satellite channel said that ISIS took advantage of the US bombing of targets in Iraq and Syria by launching an attack on the army and the popular mobilization unit forces. The United States has occupied the nearby Al Tanaf base on the Syrian side of the border since 2015 and has used it to arm and train ISIS militants. So I explained to you guys in length why do they occupy a tenth border crossing and what the uh, ISIS uh, pockets and the ISIS sleeping cells are doing on the periphery of the American bases. Basically, it's a safe zone for them. They don't attack the American forces, but they're active on the periphery. And they attack the Syrian army forces. And if the Syrian army comes closer to attack the ISIS elements, they get shot by the American forces. So yes, of course, the American um, military, they helped ISIS in Syria, directly and indirectly. And this is a so public information on, in, in Syria. You know, I, th I know that this is a shocking news for many people in the United States. But the enemy of my enemy is my friend for the United States. And they, their enemy is Iran. Their enemy is Syria, Assad, uh, their enemy is Hezbollah, and ISIS hates it hates the bonds of Assad and Iran and, and, and Hezbollah for sectarian reasons. So, yeah, of course, they use these elements against the uh, enemies of the United States. Our friend Thomas Fazi, who was a guest on our uh, channel multiple times, he had a great contribution about this case. And um, on... Uh, another friend, she, her name is Asia Legal, and uh, she said uh, that the United States is promoting chaos and destabilization in the Middle East and elsewhere in an attempt to slow down the transition from the unipolar to the multipolar world. Let's take a look together what he has to say in uh, this precisely regard. Precisely because this is the situation the U.S. finds itself in, precisely because the you know the Middle East, uh, as other regions of the world, are increasingly uh, unwilling to um, you know, take the US and Western diktats and are increasingly looking uh, east, they're looking to China, they're looking to Russia, they're looking to the wider non-Western BRICS bloc. Um, in this context, I think um, it's legitimate to assume that the US doesn't really have an interest in peace. Why would it wanna promote peace and stabilization in the region? 
when that would simply uh, consolidate uh, the trends that are, you know, that have been ongoing for some uh, some time. Uh, so uh, so in this now context, they're left hmm. in a place between a frying pan and a fire where they neither can handle the war nor do they are, are they able to handle the peace. Well, but I think that's exactly the choice they're making. So I think it might, you know, for normal people like me and you, it might appear crazy, but you got to, you know, you got to understand that these people are sociopaths. They're not, <laughs> they're not normal people. Um, so I think this is exactly the kind of strategy that the U.S. is opting for uh, in the current context. And I would say not just in the Middle East. I think uh, very much the same logic can be said to apply to Ukraine as well. Um, so in the Middle East, as in Ukraine, the U.S. isn't looking for uh, uh, a direct confrontation with Russia or with Iran or for the time being with China. Uh, so for the time being, uh, it's, it's not uh, aiming, you know, as plan A for a direct conflict with these countries. But at the same time, it's not even trying to promote um, you know, peace and normal relations with any of these countries, with any of its geopolitical enemies. Uh, so it's not going for war. Uh, it's not going for peace because it realizes that uh, so war would have untold consequences. But peace has very clear consequences. And that is kind of the formalization and crystallization of the changing balance of power at the global level, away from the US and the West towards, I wouldn't even say China, I would say towards the rest, uh, mm -hmm. towards the global majority, uh, or, the, you know, or the global South more mm -hmm. specifically, if we want to use that term, which uh, not everyone likes, uh, but just to get an understanding of what we're talking um, about. Um, and so in this context, as you say, it is between a rock and a, ha and a hard place. Uh, and it seems to have opted for a for a third way, which is that of stoking uh, chaos, uh, essentially. So to uh, uh, avoid, um, so to promote destabilization mm -hmm. in all those regions where it is losing hegemony, uh, because it views that as a way of, at the very least, slowing down the transition from the unipolar world to the multipolar world, which is, of course, happening mm -hmm. uh, and which can't be stopped. And some you know, would say that it has already uh, happened. Um, but the U.S. seems to be opting for this strategy, for this generalized strategy of chaos in various regions and in various theaters as a way of stalling, of slowing, not stalling because you can't stall it, of slowing down that process. So, guys, I totally agree with him that the United States is trying to uh, plant chaos in these regions because they want to slow down the process of moving from a unipolar world to multipolar world. But to be honest with you, I truly believe that we are already in a multipolar world and it, they cannot really slow down something that is already happening. It's not like it has established all its pillars already, but it is in the formation. And they cannot slow it down anymore. There are certain facts that you cannot really bypass. And to be honest, I just feel like the United States knows that its unipolar world is going to extinct. And it's like a dinosaur who is going to, to, to be in, extinct as a superpower. And they are just hitting right and left in a hope to uh, spread chaos. Because for them, if any power is going to come and not to replace, but to become also partner in sharing the responsibilities of the world. And for example, in the Middle East or in Eurasia or in Far East Asia, those are just in big examples. They want for these areas to be uh, in chaos so that the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians and any other big powers would have to do so much efforts to stabilize these regions instead of focusing on prosperity, instead of focusing on construction, instead of uh, focusing on development. Because if you have, if you are going to, um, if the unipolar world is going to be over anyways, and the next world order is going to be a multipolar world, as the United States, you want for your adversaries to have as much as responsibilities and as much as burden possible so that they cannot focus on their own growth and their own development and intra 
development and intra cooperation between these rising powers. This is how they see in Washington DC, right? But in China, they don't see it that way. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% independent. I do not get paid by any party, not from China, not from Russia, not from Iran, not from any other countries. I just criticize the foreign policy of the United States, but I cannot reject realities. And I cannot stay blind on the fact that the Chinese have a different approach. And this was a brilliant article that I read today, and I want to share with you this article. It's an opinion article. The author, Alex uh, he says, quite literally, China builds while America bombs, and this study proves it. He says, below is the first paragraph summing up a new study from the Center for Economic Policy Research, a pan-European independent research group. Quote, the blue are the quotations, guys. The U.S. is the world's sole military superpower. It spends more on its military than the 10 next highest spending countries combined wrote Richard Baldwin, the study's main author and a professor of international economics at IMD Business School in Lausanne, Switzerland. He says, quote, China is now the world's sole manufacturing superpower. Its production exceeds that of the nine next large manufacturers combined. Paul Krugman, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in, economy, in, uh, in economics, he wrote in the foreign Affairs magazine. I quote, China's role as the workshop of the world might be as hard to replace as the global role of the US dollar. How much of a manufacturing superpower China has? Well, China produces more than the US, Japan, Germany, India, South Korea, Italy, France, and the island of Taiwan combined. US production is three times more reliant on Chinese inputs than vice versa, while Chinese manufacturers rely less and less on U.S. supply. However, there is a single manufacturing sector over which the U.S. exercises complete global dominance, you guessed it, weapons. Worldwide military spending in 2022 hit $2 trillion and $200 billion, the highest since the end of the Cold War, according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And the U.S. defense industry accounts for a staggering 45% of all such sales around the world. With two hot wars in Ukraine and Palestine, and U.S. spending on the military approaching $1 trillion per year, the big five, Lockheed Martin, RTX Corporation, Boeing, Northrop, Grandman or Grumman and General Dynamics are salivating over the profit prospects of the coming years. A late November headline from the Washington Post said it all, Ukraine aid best kept secret. Most of the money stays in the USA, <laughs> you don't say. According to a report by the Washington headquartered Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, of the 46 active conflicts around the world, the U.S. provided arms to one or more parties for 34 of them. That was almost three out of four conflicts around the world. Now, if we pair all that with the anti-China narrative from Washington, you would have to conclude that Beijing is spreading authoritarianism through producing goods and building infrastructure, while America is producing or promoting freedom and democracy by bombing and selling weapons around the world. Remember what George Orwell wrote? War is peace. Ignorance is strength. Reality is easily turned upside down. I agree with him. And this is the biggest opportunity for the American military industrial complex, these arms, arms sellers, right? People think that in the United States, they are sending military aid to Ukraine, but most of the money is recycled and it returns back to, to, to the United States. The money stays in the United States. It doesn't go to Ukraine. This is not a help. It's not a support. It's to enrich the people who are in charge of these corporations. It is to replace the old weaponry that is <laughs> stocked in the, in, the, in the American warehouses with new ones, to produce new ones. This is an opportunity. So every conflict in the world, it's, it, it represents an opportunity for the United States to either sell weapons or to flare the uh, fires in, in this region and then probably sell for both of them because they will need weapons to fight, right? So wars are opportunities 
for the American industrial complex. This is the unfortunate truth. And that is why I am uh, one of the uh, pro pro promoters of a multipolar world so that other rising powers could, would have increased influence over the world and they would play different roles in between conflicting parties try to solve crisis by military not by military means by true diplomatic means for example the case between iran and saudi arabia and the case between turkey and syria which is being cooked by the russians and the return of Syria to the Arab League, those are all diplomatic work, right? After decades and two and three of military conflicts between them, all supported and flared. And like, if, if, if there is a little bit of fire, the United States just drops gas on it, right? And it happened in my country. We lost half a million people in my country because of a war initiated by the CIA a covert operation that they waged against Syria and they lied to the entire world and they said they are there to promote democracy and human rights just like they promoted human rights and democracy in Libya and in Iraq, right? How how are the democracies are working nowadays in these two countries, guys? Guys, we are around 500 people watching this live streaming. I would really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart if you hit the like button while you're watching this video. It really helps me with the algorithm of YouTube. Thank you so much in advance, guys. And now, since I spoke about the military industrial complex and how they sell weapons, this is a, an article published in the Newsweek. It says, it's long past time to end the Ukraine conflict. That means no more US arms or funding. It also means the U.S. security state must stop the censorship of America's speech to rid the Internet of so-called disinformation and to disappear dissidents at the behest of Ukrainian intelligence apparatuses. If not for NATO and especially U.S. arms and military aid, and if not for U.S. taxpayers subsidizing Ukrainian bureaucrats, the war would have ended long ago. Over 150,000 Ukrainian troops have been fed into the maw of death, with millions more Ukrainians displaced. No matter how long the conflict lasts, the result of the war will be the same. Russia will retain Crimea and hold control over the Donbass region. It's time to stop enriching arms dealers. This is the point that I wanted to link these two articles together, right? And this is brilliant how he explains here. It's time to stop enriching arms dealers while sim simultaneously portraying Ukrainian President Zelensky as a singular lighthouse for democracy in the region. Since the conflict began, Zelensky has banned opposition political parties, consolidated the media into one state apparatus, stifled religious freedom, and attempted to blackmail the US by forecasting a more expensive project should the United States cut off funding. The US has a moral obligation to cut all funds and arms to Ukraine, not only to save lives, but also to relieve the economic pain of American taxpayers. And no, the enrichment of the military industrial complex to the tune of tens of billions of dollars doesn't improve the economy as President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken have suggested it does. It's not incumbent upon the US and its NATO allies to help negotiate a peace settlement, although they have escalated this conflict. And by the way, I was watching a video on uh, X for Trump because Trump says when he comes to power, he will end this conflict in a one minute or in a few minutes. And I don't see that this is the case again because this is what he said. <laughs> this was just yesterday, guys. I thought that he was genuine of ending the Ukraine war. And he says uh, that he will get the European countries to match what the US is sending to Ukraine. That's not a call for cutting off arms to Ukraine. It's a call for increasing arms. He also once again brags that he increased funding NATO. Take a look. And you know, Ukraine's an interesting case. People always want to know my feeling. Number one, we're in for 200 billion plus, and the European nations are in for 20 billion. And it's more important for them. And don't you think they should equalize? Nobody asks them. It's like I did with NATO. I said, we're spending, we're, we're paying for NATO, and we don't get so much out of it. And you know, I hate to tell you this about NATO. If we ever needed their help, let's say we were attacked, I don't believe they'd be there. I don't believe. I know the people. I know them. I can tell you country by country who would be there, and who. but I don't believe they'd be there. But I took care of NATO. I said, you got to pay your bills. If you don't pay your bills, we're not going to be there to support you. And the following day, the money came rolling into NATO. But 
The European nations, if you add them up, the economy is about the same size as the U.S., believe it or not. A lot of people are surprised. You add them all up, and uh, they are in for about $20 billion, and we're in for $200 billion because we're stupid. All we have to do is say pay. Nobody ever says to them pay. You don't even hear that. I say pay, and they'll pay too. You have to equalize. I don't know if he means what he said, but this is exactly what he stated, right? He will equalize what the Europeans are sending to Ukraine from weapons and uh, support. And we need to end this war, not to send more weapons. Um, Black Tie, thank you so much, brother, for your generous support. In every live streaming you support me, I really appreciate uh, your generous support. Thank you so much, guys, also for um, watching and supporting this channel and supporting my independent work. Uh, I know that many of you are supporting me through Patreon, many of you are supporting me through PayPal, many of you are supporting me by becoming an, um, a member and of, of, of my YouTube channel. I appreciate you all. It's really important for me to have a financial independence so that I become 100% independent. I'm still not, so I have to go sometimes to other uh, jobs. Um, life is, uh, yeah, <laughs> we all have to survive, right? But when you're independent, you can speak your mind freely. And I would never, ever work for any corporation and uh, have a boss over my head telling me what I should write and what I should say. I would stay always independent. I will, I am open for cooperation with other media outlets, but the cooperation and not being under uh, the supervision of someone who is telling me what I should write and what I should tell, and this is the editorial line. I have my independence, and I would I would like to preserve that. That's gold, man. You cannot, you, you would not replace it with anything else. And as we were speaking about uh, Ukraine, you we 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 covered in the past live streaming that Zaluzhny will be sacked, and because of the news that he will get sacked, he posted this. Uh, a photo, uh, or this guy, the bald guy, posted this photo on Facebook. So Zaluzny, on eve of his expected firing by Zelensky, shows his backing from far right, which has power to overthrow Zelensky. Zaluzny takes selfie with leader of far right right sector and commander of right sector, brigade of Ukrainian military in front of a portrait of Nazi collaborator. Um, this is, uh, what was his name? I... I um, Bandera, Stepan Bandera. So Zaluzhny is taking a selfie with the commander from the right sector, a far right uh, neo Nazi group, and behind them is the um, Bandera, who was a collaborator with Hitler during World War II. And he just posted this on, on Facebook. I mean, I, if you want my opinion, I, I think that this is uh, a threat against Zelensky. Uh, because these guys can overthrow him, right? And whether you agree or disagree with the policies of Ukraine, this is something different. But Zaluzny, he's a military guy, he's a commander, he's respected among his uh, men, among his soldiers. And he has, if he has the support of the right sector and the other neo-Nazi groups, they can overthrow Zelensky in a matter of days. So Zelensky cannot survive. Zelensky is nothing. He's just a middleman, right? Those are the guys who did the fighting on the ground, most of it. And those are the strongest elements in the Ukrainian forces. Whether you like it or not, that's the unfortunate truth about this case, that the mainstream media tried to hide from the people for a long time, that there are no neo-Nazi groups there, and this is the Russian misinformation, etc., etc. And this guy, he doesn't support, for example, his German doesn't support Russia. And he says, I still reject the Russian invasion, but you really can't claim that the need to denazify Ukraine is pure pro propaganda when large parts of the country and state apparatus, including the top soldier, pay homage to Nazi criminals. Yeah. I truly don't know, guys, like the, how this war will end, especially after um, um, the visit of the biggest warmonger probably in the U.S. administration nowadays, um, Victoria Nuland. Every time I see her face, I, I feel like I'm going to vomit. I feel like she she's a walking destruction, you know? Wherever she goes, she brings destruction and misery to the people. And I hope the Ukrainians would wake up one day and realize what this woman has done to their country. I would like to thank Candid Schmiles. I hope I'm not butchering your name. Thank you so much for your generous support. Um, 
I will show you the last thing, guys. Uh, this is also, I'm happy that there are increasing voices criticizing um, what could happen in um, what's happening in Ukraine. But this guy, uh, who is a political commentator and a political editor, his name is Andrew Sullivan, he thinks, unlike what we saw now from a statement uh, uh, of Donald Trump, he says, if Trump is elected, Ukraine will be partitioned, Taiwan will at some point be given over to China, and a large number of Americans will think that is a pretty sensible, sane way of moving forward in the world. Take a look. I think if he's elected, then Ukraine will be partitioned. And I think at some point, Taiwan will be given over to China. And I think a large number of Americans will regard that as a pretty sensible, sane way of moving forward in the world. And would you be one of those large number of Americans? I'd be pretty close to them, yes. I don't think there is a desire in the United States, and has been really for the last 20 years, for consistent long engagement or support of conflicts far away from the United States. The people whose kids go to fight in those wars don't want their kids to go fight in those wars, even if they're not fighting. And a lot of people just simply look at the state of the US-Mexico border and say, why are we spending mm -hmm. billions of dollars on the border between the Russian-dominated provinces in Ukraine and the rest of it? Why? When we can't do it for our own border. That's an incredibly potent argument. So guys, this was the last video I wanted to show you, but I will also tell you this was the video that I told you about by Dave Smith, the comedian, and he made RFK look like a clown really in this discussion. I'm very happy that he confronted Dave Smith. Uh, he confronted RFK because uh, RFK was challenged by Max Blumenthal multiple times to join him uh, in a live streaming and a debate. And RFK said, yeah, 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 but then he didn't. I'm happy that uh, Dave was able to embarrass him. If you want to go and watch this uh, video, it's nine minutes on Dave Smith's um, site. And um, I think I will, I will, I will send him an email, davismissbooking at gmail.com. I will send him an email. I will explain my case. Let's see if he would like to go cooperate with me or come to my show. If I go to his show, I would really, I would really love to. Uh, to create to establish more bridges, and this is what Daniel McAdam said about RFK the other day, the funny way. RFK says that Israel represents is is a um, aircraft carrier for the United States in the region. It's the it's the ears and the eyes of of the United States in the region. I mean, the U.S. is. Uh, still a superpower it's a hegemon right they need a country like israel in the region so he is arguing from the perspective that it's our ally they are uh, uh, israel is doing our bidding they're our ears and eyes we need israel we have to support israel H how do you respond to that i mean to that question i would say for what to do what but to, to keep our illegal bases in syria uh, to keep <laughs> occupying Iraq and, and, and stealing their stuff. I mean, for what <clears throat> what purpose does Israel serve other than to make the rest of the Arab world and the region, uh, the Middle East region, hate the United States? You know, it's it's such an absurd statement. And it's, it's particularly disturbing to hear someone like RFK, who in the past has stood for peace, to sound like John Bolton on steroids. This is a neocon talking point that Israel is doing us this great favor. Uh, you know, by making everyone hate us and want to kill us. It's it's just very, very saddening. <laughs> he sounds like John Bolton on the steroids. I found that really funny and I wanted to share it with you. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in to today's live streaming. It's Saturday weekend. I finally can have some rest, go to the gym and train. If you can, you can also, uh, I highly recommend you guys going and uh to the gym practicing it's great for the mental health and the physical health i'm doing it almost every day and uh, we will i will see you by the way on monday tomorrow is a rest day and but till then thank you very much for tuning in really have a great weekend if you like this content hit the like button subscribe to my channel and if you like to support my independent work become a patron the link is scrolling on the screen patreon.com slash analysis and i will see you on monday salam <laughs>